A number of years ago, Jack asked if he and Bill Bernstein could do an informal chat as part of the agenda. And we all know that what Jack wants, Jack gets. So it's become a regular part of our conference agenda ever since. And it's now affectionately known as the Fireside Chat. Uh, Jack is here, but Jack's companion for the Fireside Chat is a retired neurologist who helped co found Efficient Frontier Advisors. He's written a number of best-selling titles on both finance and economics history. He holds both a PhD in chemistry and an MD. Please welcome one of the smartest guys I know. So I'm going to tell a little bit of a story out of, out of, out of school, because it had to do with a lunch I had uh, with a, uh, a representative from another large, passively-based mutual fund company that has, I, I think it's no secret, a succession problem. Uh, this company has excellent management. This management has no, has no succession issues at all. Uh, they're, they're a very deep bench in that regard. But their problem is ownership. They've got two owners and the owners want to get their justifiably, their just desserts out of it. And there's, in their eyes, really only two ways to do this. One is to have an in, in, in initial public offering, uh, which would be bad news. Uh, and then the other uh, solution would be to sell to a larger uh, financial corporate entity, which would be even worse news. Uh, and so I've suggested to them multiple times that they vandalize which is basically to sell themselves to their shareholders so that after 10 years or so, they, uh, they, they wind up being owned by their shareholders, like Vanderbilt does. And they looked at me and said, well, Jack Bogle did this? How much did he charge? And I said, zero. He gave it away for free. <laughs> and, and they said, well, why would he do that? And you, know, you have to know me. I tend to blurt things out. I said, well, because he's a mensch. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, of course they're not going to listen to me. Um, but um, I thought I'd, <clears throat> excuse me, start off, Jack, and ask you about uh, your personal feelings about the recent Nobel Prize laureates. I'm not going to ask you about Hansen because he's kind of a mechanic. Uh, and so I'll ask you about what you think the legacy of uh, Schiller and Thomas is what you've learned from them, where you disagree from them, and you know their their work is not entirely consistent with each other. <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> yeah, and so I'd like to, I'd like your opinion on that too. Well, I, I talked a little bit about this. I think before you got here, Bill, but let me just kind of reiterate what I think. One is, uh, I don't see how efficient markets can even be a hypothesis. Uh, because it's sometimes right and sometimes wrong. Hypothesis does not have a hold unless it's with cheese in it. And uh, the, I think the one place that both Schiller and Fama agree is that in the long run, the markets are a lot more efficient than they are in the short run, and I would totally endorse that. The, 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 the data are crystal clear that, that they tend to move toward, if you want to call it an equilibrium, I don't want to use two high-powered you know, high high-falutin phrases because that's just not my style. And not my preference, but it's uh, efficient markets. Uh, however, had nothing to do zero nada with my creation of the index funds. I never heard of Fama then, as you all know, and uh, you know, I didn't believe in efficient markets. And I spent a lot of time in my book saying, you know, there is the quantitative school. Guys out of Wells Fargo were very good, and. Uh, they ran some money for us for a while, didn't work that well for about 15 years, and then didn't work out anymore. And then sort of asset allocation stuff. They're all quants deeply into trying to prove the market is efficient. Uh, the Samsonite, well-known uh, pension plan, uh, it was the first uh, pension account to do this, and it failed uh, because they picked the wrong index. I take some pride in the fact that they finally picked the right index after Vanguard 500 came out. Uh, I don't think they were necessarily following it. They needed a good index and they picked it back. So um, the efficient markets have never had anything to do with my idea. My idea was that, this is I mentioned before and I'll mention it again, is all you need is the CMH, which is a consistent. 
cost matters, hypothesis, and, and uh, that is true under any momentary time period or any eternal time period. And that is the less cost you pay, the more your share of the market returns goes up, whether the market is efficient or inefficient, long term, short term, whatever it is. So I think efficient markets is overrated, but not as bad as Schiller says, which has done more damage to economic thinking than any idea in the history of economic thought, or some understatement like that. <laughs> and he really did say that in one of his books. Um, and uh, so they disagree, and I think it's kind of interesting, and, and in a way I like it when they award the Nobel Prize to two people who think, think exactly the opposite of one another. As to Bob Schiller, he's very creative, very smart. I like the idea of a, a he used a 15 year moving earnings target to calculate the PE. It's a long way from perfect, but it's probably better than using the last year or the next year pumped up with expectations. And so, and he's a, he's a good thinker. Uh, he has some very complicated ideas, which I think are oversimplified. For example, he wants to create a whole bunch of new financial instruments to protect us from problems in our home mortgages and that kind of thing. And the problem with any uh, aggregator of any kind of asset class, or whatever you want to call it, or any kind of derivative, is they cost money. The system takes money out. So it works less well for investors as a group than it does when it's on paper because they don't count, they do, do the pricing, they don't count the intermediary share. So um, are they both worthy of the Nobel Prize? I would have no idea, but in fact the Nobel Prize Committee has been all over this and they decide they are. So I salute them, but that doesn't mean I have to follow every word that they have. And I am, so really surprise you, totally unintimidated un uh, by the idea of taking them both on a little bit, which I did in that Wall Street Journal letter, which may or may not ever get published. And it's such a good letter, and I hated it, Michael hated it. <laughs> and the more they hated it, the more I wanted it. I mean, I did try and adjust to what they said, a little bit, kind of smack in the face sort of thing. But uh, anything that gets us thinking about these issues, and particularly issues, I mean, I've always spent a lot of time on issues that are opposed to what I say. I think it's much more valuable. Bill knows this. And by the way, what an honor it is for me to be with this guy right off the hospital bed. I ain't making me look like a biker. Uh, <laughs> I hate that. Uh, and uh, so anything that makes you think, you know, maybe I'm wrong. And I have been known to think that for a moment or two. <laughs> and uh, so you, you try and learn, you try and keep up with the academic journals. And I can say this about uh, what Taylor mentioned, uh, his, his citation from the journal uh, News Story and, and Op-Ed on Monday, um, the efficient markets had nothing to do with my creation of the index fund, uh, but it's worthwhile to look at that hypothesis to challenge it, and uh, I've been, you know, I'm pretty, pretty good at that, but I, I just want to add that there was an article from a Nobel Prize winner that in fact did inspire my creation of the first index fund, and that would be Paul Samuelson's article in the first edition of the Journal of Portfolio Management called... Uh, Challenge to judgment, and Paul Samuelson, and he's in my group. He doesn't get into efficient markets or anything like that. He says, "Show me the brute evidence that managers can win," and no one ever showed him any brute evidence that managers could win, and they haven't shown him yet. So he and uh, he and I were—he's the inspiration for me, not uh, Gene Palmer. And uh, so I, I said that to the Wall Street Journal, and Paul's. Uh, if, if someone like Paul Samuelson, who turns out to be one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet, he, he's just so brilliant, it's an embarrassment to be in the same room with him, but I get over it. <laughs> <laughs> and and he's, just, he's a very, uh, in a lot of ways, a humble guy, not I mean, like, like academics. He maybe has a touch of arrogance, but I know an a particular person who's not an academic who has a touch of arrogance, too. I'm not going to identify him. <laughs> he's right in front of me, and I'm not talking about Bill. <laughs> So um, I think he should get his credit, because it really did help me sell the idea of the index fund to the board. I'd done all the data myself, um, and then, you know, line by line, calculator by calculator, in the 1975, before that was the first thing I did was bring that index fund to the board of directors after Vanguard started in May, and it was on their desk by, I think, uh, September, August or September. And uh, they didn't know what to do about it. You know, it, had act it was being managed, but not actively managed. That was a hurdle. Uh, the data was a hurdle. Uh, but
but when you have Paul Samuelson, you've got a pretty potent weapon. And it shows you're not nuts. It may be all it shows, but that was enough. Um, yeah, we have two very fast observations, and then I'll segue into another question. Uh, the first observation is that when I fall face first into my mashed potatoes, I will not want for uh, lack of medical attention in this audience. Uh, the, the second is more serious, that, you know, I, I think Schiller is one of the most brilliant. He has a peculiar intellect and a peculiar personality that makes, that gives him his brilliant intellect, I think. It's sort of a very dissociated way of looking at the world. Uh, and he's one of the few people whose macroeconomic analyses in financial terms I listen to because he's so rationally, so divorced from popular uh, thinking. But a lot of the ideas that he has are truly bad ideas. And one of the ones is, is the one that Jack just mentioned, which is derivatizing uh, housing uh, markets. You know, theoretically they can be used to hedge. Wonderful. So can most other derivatives be used to hedge. But you know that's not what they're going to be used for. Uh, you know they're going to be used to destabilize the system and not to stabilize it. They're going to be used for speculating. Um, with that said, I want to come up with something and talk about something else that Gene Fonda has said, which gets him off the reservation, at least I think it's extremely important, which is that one thing I think we've learned uh, over the past several years that we didn't know it already is how important banks are. All right? Uh, you know, first there's police stations and courts. Then there's banks, then there's hospitals, because if you don't have banks, there are no hospitals. Uh, and we have an unstable banking system. And one of Gene Fama's ideas, Jack, is that about a quarter of bank capitalization should be equity. All right? Equity can be loaned. Uh, it's, it's, it's not going to be idle money sitting there. It's money that can earn a profit for the owners. Uh, and it's, it's kind of a naive idea. But at the same time, uh, it, uh, it has a certain appeal and also a certain support within some of the more serious members of the banking industry. So I want to know what you think about our banking structure in general and also what you think about Professor Obama's uh, suggestion. Okay, well, on, on the banking system, I even go beyond that, Bill, and, uh, and say, you know, what's happening to the world of capitalism? And I think the most worrisome trend is growing concentration everywhere, larger and larger. And the banks say, I mean, listen to Jamie Dimon, listen to anybody else in the bank area. We have to be large because our clients are so large, our customers, the borrowers and the lenders are so large, and we have to be able to accommodate them. And that is true. Uh, so I don't know how to get out of this mess, but to have the concentration in our banking system is in fact larger, I think, I think the uh, top five banks uh, have over 50% of the deposits uh, of, of all banks now. And uh, it, it's, it's probably 40% of what happens when these little banks and smaller banks, not little banks at all, smaller banks, they merge into a big one. And that concentration gets worse and worse. And every corporate merger makes the clients get bigger and bigger and demanding of more and more big banking service. And in the long run, we get a whole system of oligopoly. Uh, I'm troubled by the fact it's also happening, as, you, as I've said before, in the mutual fund industry where the top five firms have almost 50% of the assets. And they're all index firms. You, know, you, you, you like diversity in capitalism, corporate America. Uh, diversity, I'm not talking about all this gender stuff, but just in terms of the number of participants in the system. The greater number of participants in the market system, the more you're likely to get efficient markets. And uh, it, it's all dwindling and getting larger and larger. I don't know what to do about that. It's well known. I haven't done any research on this, but I will get into it one day. Thanks, Michael. Are you ready? Uh, but uh, the number of stocks that we used to have, the Wilshire 5000, and it's now called the Total Stock Market Index. I guess it's Dow Jones or whoever does it. Uh, and uh, that it got up to 7,000 stocks in the year 2000. Now it's gone, that's way above it's the 5,000 it originally began with. And now it's down to, I think, 3,200. Over half of the stocks that were in it at the market high are gone. And uh, some of that is by merger. Some of that is because the tech stocks came and then they went. And, uh, you know, it's inter interesting to me. It's a vital intellectual question. Uh, where did those companies go? And uh, what happened to them? And this is the, to the extent they're mergers. Why do we do all those mergers? And I happen to be... Uh, Real, this is really going to surprise you. 
are real cynic about these corporate mergers. I think they're done for one of two reasons, or maybe both of them at the same time. And that is one, bigger corporations pay their executives bigger salaries. So the CEO wants to do a merger. He thinks he knows everything. The board thinks he knows everything. And they pay him a lot of money for doing pretty much nothing, I think. <laughs> Let me say in the street. Well, maybe look at the record. Uh, and uh, so that's one part. And the other part is it muddies the accounting waters. You do a merger and nobody knows pro forma this, pro forma that. And all of a sudden, the shoddy record uh, looks like a good record. And uh, in terms of earnings per share, and they're just basically not credible and not believable. But we take anything that is, that is quantified, that we can, it's the perils of numeracy, one of the talks I gave all over again, and uh, reminding me of the thing in Einstein's office, which Bill knows well, I'm sure, and that is there's a sign, it's said to be a sign in Albert, Albert Einstein's office, at the former office at the Princeton Institute of Advanced Study, saying there are some things that count that can't be counted, and there are some things that can be counted that don't count. And, uh, you know, and here I am, a big mad guy, beta mogul, a data devil, <laughs> and uh, skeptical about the idea that we can quantify everything. And that's why I'm pleased to have gotten this article in the Financial Analyst Journal, where my guesses about the cost of transaction costs, about advisory costs, about cash drag, uh, are just estimates but it's better to have the estimates there, up or down, do what you will with them, anybody can change the math, and then ignore these huge costs that come along with the expense funds and fund expense ratios. So I'll be glad to have that out of the way. But you know, on banking, uh, I, you know, I had a chapter in my book called The Battle of the Soul of Capitalism, not a chapter, but a takeout in one of the chapters called Bring Back Glass Eagle. And that's what we should have done. But we couldn't do that, so we get the Volcker rule, which is I think 198 pages in the Glass-Steagall Act is 65 pages because you're trying to fuss around the edges of the system and it still hadn't gotten anywhere, it still hadn't been implemented. Uh, so you get a lot of people, banks express, I mean, these get into the big issues that confront the American Republic today and that is the power of money in the system. The banks are out there with these high paid lobbyists fighting every comma, every paragraph, uh, everything they can with all their might and they can of course outthink so the civil servants at the SEC and so on, and uh, it's not putting down the SEC, it's just they've gotten into such a complicated mess. I mean, you tell me that Jamie Dimon can take you through the annual report of J.P. Morgan and explain every item to you, and I'll say, I'm not hanging by my thumbs in the last Yeah, that, that actually raises a couple of subsidiary questions. The first of which is, if you're a libertarian, you blame Sarbanes Oxford or a decrease in the number of publicly traded companies. Do you think that's a valid argument? Uh, I'd like to look at the data, but I doubt it very much. It's an easy out. Uh, you know, it's so demanding to be a public company that I'll be a private company. Uh, first place, it's much easier said than done to do that. And second, at a certain level, when you get to really big corporations that go in private, it's impossible. I mean, I think uh, one of the challenges to the long-term investment management business is as our investment universe shrinks, uh, and it's, it's the kind of things, Bill, that very few people but you are even thinking about. And uh, that's why we need you. <laughs> um, yeah. um, I'm not sure who needs me these days, except my granddaughter. Except my granddaughter. Um, well, uh, that's, that leads me to the actually very leading question, which is the quality of financial regulation during the most current administration. We had a woman who was the SEC chairman who, as far as I can see, did not have great accomplishments. She went from one job in a quasi-private regulatory agency in which she had a seven-figure salary, and now she's going through the revolving door uh, into, uh, into uh, another job with an eight-figure salary. And uh, one should not be surprised, or might not be surprised, uh, if she didn't do great things. And I'm wondering what your, your view of her tenure was. Now, this is... Mary Shapiro. Yeah. <laughs> well, first of all, uh, I empathized with Mary Shapiro. She was trying her best to do the right thing, and the industry ganged up. I mean, some was irresponsible and disgraceful. Like you know, in Union Station, the SEC is now right next door. They had all these signs saying, you know, down with 
uh, asset value, floating asset value of money market money. Basically, arguing with the SEC and with the people that are walking in and out of the SEC doors every day. You know, I don't think we need to stoop to that. There's a rational argumentation that we should use and not a sensationalist orientation. But, uh, you know, she was right on money market funds. She was right on a lot of things and basically ended up getting very, very little done because this industry mobilizes. I mean, this is a powerful lobbying industry. And uh, I think it should look to its own interests uh, more. You know, there's obviously a complete conflict of interest in the fund industry. It's being run, they call it the Investment Company Institute, and it's the Investment Managers Institute. That's a big difference. You know, I don't see any evidence they're looking after the interest of, of fund shareholders. It's run by the managers, and the managers are paying the dues, and the managers have their own lobbyists. So um, I, uh, I'm not bothered by her accession. Uh, I was, and I, I should say this: I come to it from a background before she took over the chairmanship of being pretty skeptical of Mary Shapiro, and uh, I ended up being kind of a Mary Shapiro booster. And maybe I'm just a sucker for you know someone who's trying to do the right thing and gets it thrown back in their face. I know a lot about that subject. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, to shift gears ever so slightly, uh, as scintillating as this year is going to be, it won't be quite as interesting as Die Hard 8 was in 2008, which I think was, what, two weeks or one week post Lehman. Uh, we almost got there, though. Uh, and so that's my next question, which is the view from the precipice, which we just stopped short of, and the view over the precipice. What do you think the long... Uh, uh, run debt, long run damage was done in the financial system with the most recent uh, Brovio in Washington, and what could have happened? Well, you know, those are, you know, I guess I was going to say questions above my pay grade. <laughs> but uh, let me just give you a couple of reflections. Uh, I begin, which in turn had to be totally true, with that, our idiotic statesman, less than statesman like uh, elected officials. And that is, it, I begin with Churchill's statement that Americans always do the right thing, but only after they've tried everything else. <laughs> <laughs> and we came, I mean, I'm not sure, I didn't, didn't get a chance to read the morning papers yet, but we probably came within an hour to get President Obama's signature on that bill, an hour of the actual default. I think it was done before midnight, pretty much had to be. But maybe, you know, Congress often sets the clock back. And so it makes everything that's illegal, legal. But uh, <laughs> it's, to me, incredible how people can get so dug in with their own personal agenda uh, that they can fail to see what is obviously good for the nation. And they can fail to see, I mean, I don't want to get into too much politics here, but uh, I might have, might have mentioned this word before, but uh, the president cannot be held hostage, uh, cannot have hostages held and said, you do this. If you want to ever see your cousin again or your wife again, uh, that's just not the right way to negotiate. There's a big difference between negotiating over the right things and negotiating in a hostage situation. And it's just about every government and every corporation has found out you just can't finally negotiate uh, with people who are holding hostages. There's no, no final way to win, so you just say, do what you will, and then get as many bodies in there, FBI, whatever it might be, to try and do this, un undo the, the situation by intervention of some kind, and it's a risky thing to do. Uh, so, as we're going to see, I guess, in Captain Phillips, I haven't seen that yet, but uh, those, kind of, those kind of hostage taking things are not the right way to do it. It's time for negotiation, and time not. And, it's, and what I have been amazed at, honestly, Bill, is uh, true to my trying to keep against all odds a balanced viewpoint about the political system. I read the journal, Wall Street Journal, as well as the New York Times. And the journal has been so much more scathing than the New York Times about how the Republicans, basically the journalist constituency, got themselves into such a loser's game and a mess that it's really, it's really tough in the Republican Party. And you, everybody knows that they finally give up because they're losing in the court of public opinion. But that brings up the worst point that affects our political, I think the single worst thing that affects our polit political system, and that is these safe boroughs used to call them rotten boroughs in England, like Big Bill, in the old days, the long old days. But these safe seats, mm -hmm. the, you know, kind of the more strident, the less reasonable you are, the more likely you are to be reelected. And if you're even a moderately 
conservative person, you're probably going to be confronted in the next primary with someone who is just off the wall on the right side of things. There doesn't seem to be a contravening force on the left. Well, I think the journal would say that the, the, the uh, labor unions are such a force. I'm not sure they have that much power, but there we are to each his own on that one. So that's a, it's a, a real problem to have these basically locked in seats that care, that are, that are so safe that you know, they may be around for a long time. You know, I, I heard this data the other day, and I, I'm not sure I'm going to get it right, but you know, as everybody knows, the House of Representatives is around number 60, 40 Republicans. But the votes cast for the House of Representatives are roughly 60, 40 in favor of Democrats. Think about that. So when these people say, we're representing the people, they're representing this minority of the people and not the majority of the people. And I'm reminded if I can give you one more of the better quotes of the day, not, not a current one, but a, a, a quote that will indicate that Benjamin Franklin was not without some wisdom about the long term. He came out of the Constitution Convention, Independence Hall down here, when the, the deal had been signed, the Constitution had been approved by the Constitutional Convention, going out to the states, and uh, a woman comes up to him and says, what have you given us, Dr. Franklin? And he said, we have given you a republic if you can keep it. <laughs> and I think we're endangering that. And I think that's a very, very serious, if totally unquantifiable risk. Um, but to get to the second question, Jeff, which is what do you think could have happened uh, and you know, what, 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 what would have happened, do you really think, had, had defaulted on treasuries? I think it would have resulted in such financial chaos all over the world that we would have thrown ourselves into not a, not a, a depression, a very deep, a very deep recession. And, and there's no way to know that. Thank God there's no way to know it. Uh, but when you think about the, the dollar being the international world currency, basically, currency of the world right here, that, that would go into those circumstances, I think. But to think about this powerful nation, the most powerful, and except for from a financial standpoint, nation on earth, not able to pay or not willing to pay its interest, and that gets to the interest on its debt, and that gets to the idiocy, mm -hmm. the utter idiocy of a debt limit. Because a debt limit is basically a, a way of saying, um, you know, we're going to spend X, and we're not going to charge any taxes for it. Mm -hmm. And if you end up, so you're going to borrow money, but we're going to tell you how much you can borrow when the mathematics of that equation or establish the moment you undertake the expenditure. You gotta pay for it. It may be difficult to do. You gotta have higher taxes. You gotta get rid of tax loopholes, whatever you wanna say. And uh, that gets me to another of my favorite, I don't know if I should be talking politics here, I know I shouldn't, but the <laughs> idiocy, the arrogance, the disgrace of these hedge funds getting capital gains taxes on their incentive fees is just so moronic it, it, and so unfair. <laughs> And uh, it, it, it's a, just, a, I call it a national disgrace. Why should that be? Why should the people that have more than anybody else in America pay lower taxes? And that's because Senator Schumer, who happens to be a director, is head of the Senate Finance Committee, and he's not going to let it happen. His constituency that down there in Wall Street, mostly, is not going to let it happen. And of all the simple reforms, and the only argument I've ever heard against it is it would affect some other things. I don't know how that would be. And the other one would be it doesn't raise a lot of money. Well, damn it, if it's wrong, it's wrong. And if it raises five cents, or even to do it right, loses five cents, I couldn't care less. But there is there is such a thing as moral absolutism. And there is such a thing as right and wrong. And uh, sometimes they're very difficult to see. Uh, and sometimes I think I see it a little more clearly than the fact is, I'll admit that. But, uh, you know, we just got to have more of a, more of a thought about what's good for this great nation and what's going to keep us from getting into even more trouble we're having, we're having now. Um, I, I was intrigued by the identification of the, the big fund companies, Fidelity, BlackRock, Vanguard, as financially significant, systemically important financial institutions, SIPIs. Uh, and, you know, I could see how AIG and Lehman did stupid stuff, stupid stuff, and got themselves in, and, and the financial s system into trouble. What kind of stupid stuff could Vanguard, Fidelity, and BlackRock do that would get the, uh, uh, the uh, financial system into trouble? Well, usually trouble comes, everybody knows, from leverage. 
uh, you know, you've got obligations you can't meet, uh, and uh, interest payments due on the money you've borrowed, and that's a very, uh, that's what banking is all about, of course, finally. And you don't have those kind of issues in, in sci-fi, what do you call Sci-fi? <laughs> Sippy. Sci-fi sounds better, science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you don't have the, the borrowing issue. But I do think that we are, in fact, systematically important financial institutions. The concentration in this business has gotten bigger, uh, the, uh, gotten more narrow. Uh, that is to say, five firms acquire, I must have mentioned this before, half of all the mutual fund assets. And I don't think that's a particularly healthy thing. Uh, but I can't put my finger on precisely what's wrong. But the things I would look first to is, supposing there is a run of redemptions, what well, you're going to say, or somebody, well, not you, Bill, is going to say, well, you know, if you get too many redemptions, there'll be a lot of sales, and the market will, you know, <coughs> find this intersection, and uh, it'll go down, and then buying will, will, buying will come in, and that's just light in the marketplace. And in some of these scares we've had in the last few years, that short-term malfunction in the marketplace, you know, darn well are going to be corrected pretty quickly. You know, maybe in a day. And investors care about that, but only very foolish investors care about that. You know, it's going to be all come out in the, in the relationship of price to value, uh, and uh, whether there's a bubble or not. So, you know, it, it's, it's not easy to say uh, what the consequences of it are. Even as I say, absolutely, you know, if these five firms control, let me say, 20% of all the stocks in stock in America, and if you had another 10 firms, it's probably 50%, 10 firms controlling 50% of the stock in America. There's something you ought to be concerned about. The fact that you don't particularly know what you should be concerned about doesn't mean you should raise a little alarm to me uh, and uh, alert everybody, uh, await the ICI's passionate response, stay out of our business, uh, and uh, and I do particularly worry about, in, on the municipal bond side, and particularly for Vanguard, because we're the dominant force, and the muni market everybody knows is not particularly liquid, and I talked a little bit about this earlier. So, um, you know, maybe a, some kind of an idea of having a reasonable amount of reserves to meet demand, to meet uh, redemptions in that business would be a good idea. I hope we still do, but I don't know. And uh, it's, it, it, if the concentration grows, and there's no sign it's doing other than growing, uh, you know, at some point, uh, it's just too much concentration. But we never know how much is too much. I mean, it's, you know, like, you write down a number, and, and uh, I don't think that does it. I think what captures it is uh, basically a little bit like corporate America, a concentration of economic power. And uh, we're systematically important because we can tell any corporation in America, the mutual fund industry can, what we want them to do. We can tell them how much to pay their CEOs. We can tell them anything we wish to. And we don't do any of that. That's a whole other issue. But that means you're systematically important. It doesn't mean there's any terrible risk coming with it, although I think there is the liquidity idea of risk. And that's all I can honestly come up with uh, to think about something nearby. But I'm glad to have the government look at it that way. 31 pages long. Uh, I've read it because uh, I read that kind of stuff. And uh, I didn't see anything to really worry, but they have the same kind of numbers that I'm doing every day, with the concentration of one of the largest firms is and things like that. But they're pretty good report. They don't come out with any conclusions. But I think the idea that we are systematically important basically has to be tautologically correct. You know, if you own, as mutual funds do, about 32% of all the stock in America. And that in itself, not to get you into this any deeper than you want to be, but it's only the tip of the iceberg. When you look at these 25 largest mutual fund firms, every single one of them also has a pension management affiliate. And if you take the two of them together, their pension funds and their mutual funds, they own, I think it's 55% of all the stock in America. These are powerful institutions. And the fact they aren't exercising that power is either A, a national disgrace, or B, a national asset. <laughs> and you'll have to tell me which is which. <laughs> okay, well, I, I think what I'll next do, and perhaps close it up, uh, at least in terms of the formal buyers out of chat here, is let's chat has questions for me, which is 
that, you know, so let's end with a personal finance uh, question, which is, I don't know if Wade Fowl is in the audience. If he is, raise your hand, Wade. Uh, there you go. Hey, Wade. Uh, he hasn't, you haven't presented your paper yet, have you? Okay, great. Well, Wade, Wade has done a very important piece of work, which bears on the glide path of asset allocation throughout age, uh, or at least in retirement. And correct me if I'm wrong, Wade, uh, but, you know, the rule of 100 serves pretty well. I think it's a pretty good rule. Starting uh, point. Yeah, pretty good starting point. Uh, and Wade has come up with something different. It's a very fine analysis that shows that if you start retirement uh, with a given allocation, you're actually better off if you raise that allocation throughout retirement as you get older. Uh, and I think, you know, he's, he's done an excellent analysis. I think he's right. And I can even come up with some narrow stories and explain why he's right. Uh, but I'm wondering what you think of that idea. In other words, you should really be 80 or 90 percent stock. Bob <laughs> <laughs> Dole would say, whatever. <laughs> uh, I, there's one thing about mathematical analysis which depends on a whole lot of hypotheses about future returns will be, all of which are uncertain. Even the great Bogles, that's in quotes, uh, are uncertain. And uh, you want to really be careful of extending you know, your ideas into somebody's actual living platform. And you do not want to ignore the behavioral problem. You would like to ignore it. You should ignore it. Uh, investors should ignore it. But you're building kind of a world there where you're, uh, you're asking for the impossible. So I'd be interested in hearing Wade's thing. But before we end this, I, you know, I hope I can just push Bill a little bit. If he's up to it after getting out of the hospital, oh my god, what a miracle. Uh, we, you're, you're making me look bad, man. <laughs> uh, but talk a little bit about your three books, your three chapters on the, on the investor. Okay, well, um, for, for those of you who, who haven't yet bought all three of my e-books, um, uh, I have a series which is called Investing for Adults. Um, and what I, see by, what I say by adults, I mean people who know all the things that just about everybody or everybody in this audience knows about active management, about there's no stock picking theory, there's no market timing theory, there's no risk theory. Uh, and so the first book we looked at life cycle investing uh, was somewhat congruent actually with the paper that Wade did as well. In fact, Wade helped me with, uh, with it. Uh, and and uh, it, it just looks at life cycle throughout age, and it takes a somewhat different point of view uh, from, from the rule of 100. I say it's a good place to start, but at the end of the day, uh, I, I default back that the retiree really is in two-bucket territory. That you, you know, it's nice to have one bucket and think of one portfolio throughout most of your life, but when your human capital runs out or is about to run out, uh, what really matters to you most is your liability matching portfolio. That is the portfolio you need, the money you need, in addition to whatever pensions and social security you've got, to make sure that you're not diving the dumpster, all right? And, and maybe have a you know, living standard which is closer to what you might be. And beyond that, you can invest in very, very risky assets. Well, if you think about what happens as your uh, retirement progresses, you start out at age, you know, if you're a bogelhead, 48, uh, and you have no human capital left because you're bouncing your, your grandkids on your knee, you're spending all your time in Florence. Uh, and, and so you have this liability matching portfolio that's pretty large that you need. You probably don't have a lot of money left over from that. Okay, well as, so that's a low stock, that's a low, a low stock allocation, that's a high bond stock allocation. Well as you get in advance slowly into, into geezerhood, what happens is, is that you need less and less of a liability matching portfolio. And if you're reasonably disciplined and you're a vocal head, your, 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 your um, uh, risk portfolio gets larger, okay? Now, unfortunately in the United States, most people don't get anywhere near uh, having a liability matching portfolio, but then again, we, you know, this is an alternative universe in this room. Uh, so, so we're not really talking about that. The second book really wasn't aimed at this audience. It was a book called Skating Where the Puck Was, and it's about alternatives. Uh, and basically alternatives weren't a bad idea 20 and 10 years ago. Hedge funds actually did have positive alpha 15 and 10 years ago. 
They don't anymore. Uh, and that's simply because uh, you know, David Swenson went through the head of the uh, head of the, uh, the buffet table, and he got the sirloin and the lobster tail. And the guys who were, you know, who came who came through, you know, behind him got the got the um, got the chopped hamburger. And unfortunately, David Swenson then went and tried to go through the line a second time. He got he got mac and cheese uh, <laughs> from from 2007 until 2012. And that's. That's what that book is about. It's why alternatives in the modern era, that is, you know, the past five or 10 years are simply a terrible idea because there's just far too many people uh, chasing far too many alternatives, including one that might be important to discuss in this audience, and that's commodities. Uh, I have two words about commodities, which is stay away. Uh, or at least, at least commodities futures funds. Uh, I'm, I'm more sympathetic towards commodities producers. The third book was a book called um, <laughs> Deep Risk. Mm -hmm. And Deep Risk is about the two different kinds of risk, which you can, you know, and I don't mean to denigrate shallow risk. Shallow risk is, you know, temporary stock market falls, which can be a very high magnitude, but eventually or fairly quickly recover. And I don't mean to denigrate shallow risk, because if you are someone with very little or no human capital then shallow risk is really important, all right? Uh, and in fact, you shouldn't even be concerned about deep risk at all. But if you're 23 years old and you have no investment capital and you have a large amount of, uh, of, uh, of, of human capital left, then you should be very concerned with deep risk. And what are the deep risks? Well, I list them there. Inflation, deflation, confiscation, and devastation. All right? And inflation is the single most important one. And if you look at the long-term returns of stocks and bonds in multiple countries over the past century, almost in a quarter, what you find is that inflation is a much bigger risk uh, to, uh, to bonds than to stocks. Uh, if you have inflation for a period of 30 or 40 or 50 years, it's a very high magnitude, you can actually have good stock returns, real stock returns. All right, which happened in a number of countries, most particularly Israel and Chile. And even the nations that you, you, you think of as having awful inflation, uh, like Argentina and Brazil, over 20 and 30 years, at, at least had zero real returns. You didn't lose real purchasing power. I was amazed to find that during the Weimar inflation of the 1920s, the wheelbarrow phase, stocks actually had a positive real return because they were viewed as a positive store, as a real store of, of value. Bonds, on the other hand, get absolutely hammered, that you lose all your money in bonds. So if you're concerned about deep risk, you really do want to invest in stocks for the long run. I don't deflation, I don't view deflation in the fiat money era, now that we're off the gold standard, as being a serious issue, uh, because it just doesn't exist anymore, okay? Japan really hasn't had, people talk about Japan having deflation. Uh, during the past 10 or 12 years, I think they've had 2% total deflation, all right? Uh, it, uh, Ireland and uh, Hong Kong had, I think, double digits for a relatively short period of time. That's it, three countries out of, you know, 200 and some odd countries in the world uh, that really, that really had deflation. Um, you know, confiscation, you can move abroad, good luck with that. You know, you can play uh, Gerard Depardieu and become a Russian citizen. Uh, and, you know, when you talk about devastation in this day and age, uh, you can, you know, buy an interstellar spacecraft. <laughs> uh, and so that's what the book is, is really about, is how you think about portfolio management in terms of those books, in terms of those risks. One thing I like about what Bill has done, and I thought the same thing about Peter Bernstein, is I am, in, you know, looking at myself in a kind of jaundice way, I'm kind of a one-trick pony. Uh, but Peter Bernstein, to a much greater extent, Bill, has such a range of interests, and I love it when investment people self-trained investment people uh, have a lot of other interests and he's written these books about the history of the, the uh, world of plenty it's called or something comes to that the growth of some of plenty birth, birth of plenty birth of plenty and then uh, his newest one is uh, about communications is that a fair way to describe communications it? technology and uh, human communications technology and others about world trade called the splendor ex a splendid exchange I'm plugging you here, Bill. Thank you. Um, all, all available on Amazon. But it's, uh, it's the broad gauge view that I think finally is, in a way, a counterpoint to what I do. I'm very happy with what I do. I'm sure it's right because it's a simple man. 
But if you're going to go beyond that, uh, listen to someone like Bill, who has such a broad range of experience and, and such a, not to, not to um, embarrass him, but uh, such intellectual brilliance. And uh, it's a little bit like Paul Sagas, and I'll put you in his camp. Um, and that is, uh, I love to be associated with people who are hell once smarter than I am. It's amazing how much you can learn if you just take a minute to think, uh, take a minute to think of ideas in particular that are not those that you hold dear, but maybe even counter opposing ideas. And one of the issues, and I, I hope that Bill can have a minute to comment on this, is when you get to asset allocation. Uh, it seems to me quite apparent, I don't know how to do it, but it's quite apparent that the way you look at asset allocation depends on the relationship, oversimplified statement, but it'll make the point, on the relationship between bond yields and stock yields. And back in the Paul Volcker era, uh, the 10 year treasury was 16%, or at least 15%, and it got down to 1.5%. So, what rule might have applied when you had that kind of an option to protect your money? Uh, in in uh, the 19, early 19, I guess, early 1970s, um, when bond yields were so generous, and they were generous for years and years, and that's why we have a bull market in bonds, with the, with the returns going down as interest rates go down. And the returns were good for the, those that held it, and then probably when you get back into the, uh, the treasury, if you could just buy a, a, a principal-only treasury bond, you then there could have been no better better investment than the U.S. Treasury. Nobody saw it at the time, but that's, I think, because they couldn't do the math, and I'm afraid I, even I didn't think about it enough at the time. But my question, I guess, Bill, is what do you think about, conceptually, the idea of taking into account when you're talking about safety in bonds and uh, growth in stocks, if you will, about taking into account the yield differential uh, that, that exists, sometimes greatly in favor of of uh, bonds, sometimes kind of today I would call it more or less neutral, maybe a little bit better in bonds, but not much. Uh, but taking that into account conceptually, and then uh, the much more difficult question is, uh, when, you, when you come to grips with it conceptually, assuming you think there's some reason to it, how the hell do you implement it and when? Well, that's a very interesting question, Jack. Um, uh, I'll, I'll tell another story out of school here. Uh, first of all, First part that was a little older dash. When people when people ask me, usually it's people from who aren't from New York ask me if, if because my last name is Bernstein, I was related to Peter, and I always say two things. Number one is I wish. Number two is one who was he's who I want to be when I grow up. Um, but but I can you know I mean I, I learned at the feet of the master Jack. Uh, you know I, I you know you taught me the, 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 the three step for estimating stock returns and comparing them to bond returns. Uh, and you know, of course it matters. Uh, and, and and now I'll tell my out of school story, which is I had dinner with you some years ago, uh, and, uh, some now, not too long, from, too far from two thousand. I'm getting nervous. And, <laughs> and and I waited until you had drank. I think it was your dry martini before I asked you one. this question. Yes, one, just one. And I finished my beer because I needed to screw up my courage. And I said, Well, Jack, um, you know, tips are now yielding four percent. Uh, and 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 uh, stocks look like they're priced to yield a real return of two percent. This was in the day back when you know yields were one percent back in the, the early two thousands or the late late nineteen nineties. And I said, doesn't that in impact your, your asset allocation just a little bit? And you said, yeah, I'll probably own five percent less stocks. <laughs> and of course, you know, not too long after that, Jack. You know, I, I think I went to my first Bogleheads, and he, he flips up a slide, and he projected negative real returns, not real returns, excuse me, nominal returns, negative nominal returns for the next 10 years for stocks, and everybody guessed, because you brought in mean reversion, which was something that I wasn't even willing to, to, to think about. Mean um, reversion of the PE. Yes, mean reversion of the PE. So, you know, what, what's it look like in 2013? Well, you as well as I can. Stocks, excuse me, bonds have a, a zero return, pretty much. Certainly a zero real return. Stocks are priced to yield a you know, positive 3.5% return. Real return, real return. So, all right, maybe you should own, you should own more stocks now. But 
then what happens, Jack, if we get mean reversion of PEs? Well, that gets to, and I talked a little bit about this maybe before you got here, about where the PE is today. And uh, there are so many ways of calculating, and I went through that earlier, and I won't take you through it again. But I'd say they are within the bounds of reason in terms of the future. I don't think, I mean, the PEs go from, and I'm using a range of, uh, I think it's 20 for the operator, uh, the uh, reported earnings, past, past reported earnings, and about 15 for the future earnings, so-called, counting only operating earnings, the, the lower earnings, the higher earnings figure. And so let's just use 17, just for the hell of it, you gotta start somewhere. And uh, you know, if you went to 20, that would have very little impact on your returns, a PE of 20 from there. And if you went from 15, that would have very little positive impact. And not enough, you know, since they're all guesses, I'd say not enough to change your course of action. So uh, I don't see a lot of mean reversion there. Although there's the reality, and I think I might have it. Do I have this in the John Wasik's book, Michael, the reversion of PE? It, it will, it, it, I think it's in, I think I put it in the forward I wrote to John's book. And that is what we know about past experience, which is not without utility here, is that if a PE is over 20, uh, the odds are about 85% that it will go down in the next 10 years, by the end of the next 10 years. And if the PEs are under 12, the odds are also about 85%. It will go up in the next 10 years. So you have a little bit of that uh, going for you. A little bit of knowledge about some kind of reversion that's more likely to take place than not. Not mathematical purity or precision at all, but when you get through it all, you know, the dividend yield is pretty precise and it's highly unlikely to be cut again for a long time, but it could be, of course. Earnings growth is going to have something to do with the GDP. Earnings growth is slower, as everybody should know, but uh, there should be earnings growth of some dimension. And the one thing I'm interested in what you think about this, Bill, is, is uh, I assiduously calculate nominal stock returns and then take out uh, an estimated inflation number, so they're two discrete numbers that lead to the, to, 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 to the uh, real return. Uh, I'm very uncomfortable with numbers that don't have that kind of a split, where they build the CPI into maybe earnings growth, from nominal earnings growth to real earnings growth. First, I'm not sure where it all should come out of there. I'm not sure how to handle that. But uh, I like the knowledge that I can make my own inflation adjustment looking at it and uh, not be wrapped up in somebody else's. So I can take each step of this way. And what I like about this surprise, I like one of my own ideas. <laughs> um, but what I, love, what I like about my is they're very discreet. You cannot argue about the dividend yield. You can argue about the earnings growth, but only within limits. I mean, I think we all know it's not going to be 15%, and we all assume it's not going to be zero. So you pick your own number for earnings growth. That's two thirds of the equation, a known and a highly likely. And the PE, when you get down there, you know the probabilities. So uh, it's, it takes a lot of the mystery out of stock returns and it focuses on not doing anything less than 10 years. Oh, they still ask me, Maria Bartiromo still says, how do you feel about today's market? Yeah, okay, well, Mel, Mel just told me his stomach is really starting to growl. Uh, so I'll make this snappy, I, 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 you're right. It well, that's great, great food for thought, but uh, people probably want to put some food in their belly. Okay, yeah. uh, so I, I don't think it matters that much. Jack, uh, you earlier quoted Ben Franklin, and uh, Ben Franklin has another famous saying that I like to quote, and that's, a penny saved is a penny earned. So we thought this Ben Franklin bust was appropriate because you saved investors trillions of pennies and billions of dollars. Please accept this as a reminder of the 2013 Vote Rates Conference, and a reminder of all the money you saved investors. Oh, and that. Next to them, 
But something's going to have to go off in that. <laughs> yeah, I, I promise. I know you said that, but we just thought this was so appropriate. So oh, this, this is perfect. This will be the last one. Exactly. <laughs> oh, I don't want to hear about the last anything. <laughs> Well, thank you all very much, and I, you know, how you can handle as much BOGO is beyond my comprehension, uh, but you've all been very generous. You, when, when, when my wife says, well, she's kind of doesn't do it anymore, she says, how does the speech go? And I say, well, I don't really have any idea, but I do know this. When I laughed, they laughed. <laughs> when I cried, they cried. And when I sat down, they applauded. <laughs> Thank you.